Hello. Welcome. And we'll just get started. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the Self-Care Rockstar Show, where each week I invite experts from around the world to share stories and information that will help you begin and continue your self-care journey. My goal is to encourage each of you to become self-care rock stars and to not only fill your cup, but to cause it to overflow. If you're interested in any course or programs I'm currently offering, I have some great ones out there. You can find me at findsally.com and click on schedule a call or email me at sally at the selfcarerockstar.com. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Mary Elizabeth Jackson to the Rockstar stage. Mary is a children's book author and the co-founder of Writer's Corner and Special Needs TV shows. She is in both the Fearless Entrepreneur and Invisible No More, Invincible Forevermore books with me. And today we're going to talk about the power of writing and using writing for healing in self-care. Um, Thank you so much, Mary, for being here. I'm excited to have you. Um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your story and um, how did you got involved with writing children's books? Mm. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And this is such a great subject to talk about self-care, right? Because um, it is a hot word right now. It's becoming more, um, I don't want to say popular, but it's more it's acceptable conversation to have instead of we uh, being so selfless, we really do have to take care of ourselves. Um, and I am a wife and a mother of three children. I have two children on the spectrum. So I'm also an advocate for special needs and disabilities. And it's a very big part of my life. So I, I help uh, families go in um, to class, you know, that when they need services for their children in school. Um, and just it, it, the advocacy part, Sally, it's really interesting. It, it, just kind of has morphed into so many other areas. And when we talk about self-care, that's a way of being an advocate because we have to be an advocate for ourselves, don't we? Not just someone else, but ourselves too. So it kind of, it really goes in all different kinds of directions. Um, I also, like Sally said, have both the shows that I co-founded and co-host those shows. Um, and we have been doing Writer's Corner Live for a little over three and a half years. And, and well, a little over three years, excuse me. And that is, we feature authors that are all the way from debut to New York Times bestsellers, international bestsellers, uh, multi-award winners. And we also have had publishers on and we've had illustrators on. And we'd like to kind of feature everything in that world that we possibly can and help readers uh, find new authors and new books to love. It's been such a great journey meeting um, all those, all the folks that we've met and hearing their backstories. It's really fascinating. And then special needs is all about that world, about disabilities and the challenges people face and information and resources and interviews and things like that. But I did not become published until um, 2017. So I have been a writer my whole life. Poetry is my go-to and it's my love. And I have not, but the funny thing is I haven't, I published anything poetry wise yet. I've got to get the nerve up to do that. Isn't that funny? So I could sit and write children's books every day, but the poetry thing, I'm like, Oh, even though it's my favorite. Um, and it's kind of what I go back to a lot of times when I am using writing for healing or processing, a lot of times, uh, poetry will come out and it's, it's a way for me to self-express when I don't really know what I'm feeling. So it's very therapeutic and healing. Even if I never do anything with it, I just have it for myself, you know, and say, okay, I, I, I did this. Um, but my, I got pregnant surprisingly, it was not expected at 45. So it was really late in life. And through the process of a very um, difficult ending of a pregnancy and recovery for me, but so both of us were very challenged, my son and I, um, and that recovery period is when the first manuscript came for my children's series. So I really had no idea I was going to birth a baby in a children's series, but that's kind of, I got twins. So that's kind of how that happened, you know, but it, in this state of complete and utter, I say that I was in a complete state of gratitude, just almost like I've never been in my life that I can remember for being alive and he's alive and we're okay is where this download of the book came. And I mean, literally it came just like that. It was like, I was praying and then the book came. <clears throat> and so 
I always carry a notebook with me. I use my audio recorder on my phone a lot. I tell uh, other writers, people who want to write, that's something I tell them. Always make sure you have something with you because you don't know when those sparks of inspiration are going to come. And if you don't write them down, they don't come back the same way. You know, I, I was in meditation last night and something came to me and then I got really tired and I was like, oh, I'll write it later, but I know better. So now today, this morning I was writing and I was trying to remember it. And it was like, oh my gosh, you know, I couldn't remember what it was. And I was like, oh, it sounded so cool. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. But then trying to remember it was like, oh no. So I didn't, I sat on the manuscript for, I think it was about two years before I did anything with it because I was busy taking care of a newborn baby. Right. So I was very busy with that. I had two other children. I was still trying to recover myself. I had a child who had challenges. He hadn't, he didn't sleep for the first two years of his life. You know, he couldn't swallow when he was born. You know, we had numerous problems with him in the, it, when he was very little. Um, and so that took up all of my life, but there was also that thing where you don't really think anybody's going to want to read what you have to write. So that goes back to that low self-esteem or things that have happened in your life and that, that level of not believing in yourself. But in those two years, I I kept feeling this, like somebody tapping on my shoulder saying, you got to do something with this. You really have to do something with this. And I was like, oh my gosh, someday, right. You know, I'll save it for my kids someday. And so finally it got to be so, um, I don't want to use the word annoying. It just it happened so much <laughs> that I finally said, okay, fine. So I went to someone who was published already, but they introduced me to another person who was published and we instantly hit it off. He read everything that I had written at the time. And he really liked the first manuscript that turned into the first book. And he asked if he could write 10 songs for the book. So the first book, Perfectly Precious Poolicious, and it is a play on words because we're talking littles, right? And they love funny words, you know, and it makes it more fun to learn and remember. Um, And so he wrote 10 songs to that book. So then we wrote the next two together. And the third one just released actually uh, June this summer. So very excited about that. And it sort of follows the line my intention when I started it was to follow the journey of my son and his life and his growth. And so like the first one is for little bitty babies. And, um, cause I really believe even when they can't see very well, if you, you place them, cause this is what I did with my son when he would get very irritated and he was little, you know, younger than three months, I would turn him around in my lap and I would hold open a book that was, you know, for him to look at. And it would instantly calm him down. And so I kind of took the things that I've learned from him and his growth and my other girls and using every opportunity that I had to teach them things and tried to use that to, and and I'm still trying to use that in the books that I write. So it's, that series is about accepting who you are, however you come into this world, because that's really, really important. Um, that we accept who we are and, and we teach our children to do the same thing because sometimes kids are born with challenges and they need to know they're okay. Just because the world says they're broken doesn't mean they're broken. You know, Yeah, I bought books for my daughter. I mean, I was reading to her in the womb. <laughs> yes. I was sitting, reading to her. I couldn't wait to get, and I, I remember I went and bought like this set of, of like, like, um, Black Beauty and, and Hansel and Gretel and um, all yeah. of these, uh, you know, big books. And I would sit even as, as a baby, as an infant and just read to her. And, and she's a teacher now and she loves, she's been a reader her whole life, but that was something that I wanted to instill in her at, at a young age. That um, love is very important. And in people, they, I guess there's a lot of us that don't realize the power of that and the power of those sacred moments with the child, whether it's with mom or dad or a caregiver or a sibling, you know, the, the books I have, they're very large font and in big pictures said that even a child who is a new reader can read to their siblings, but there's a lot of power in that. You know, I listened to a lot of orchestra uh, music, orchestral music when I was pregnant with my daughters and uh, both of them have 
played in the orchestra. I mean, it's, I have, my oldest is a music major. So that love, that music has always been with them. And um, it's, it's amazing what, you know, the early learning started in the womb, didn't it? Yeah. 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 And I want to talk a little bit about your poetry because I am, mm-hmm. um, I went through, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but I go through these phases of like creativity um, mm-hmm. where it's, you know, all right. And I, I had maybe five or six years. It was like 2010 through 2012 or 2013, where every day I woke up with a poem. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and I would sit down and I couldn't, I couldn't not write it down. I mean, it was like, I would wake up in the morning and I would have the first line and it would, some of them would take me three, four or five days to write. Like I would write it and I would be thinking of it throughout the day or whatever. And then like, yeah, I would say, all right, I'm done with that for now. And I'd walk away and the next morning I'd wake up with the next line or the next stanza of it. So I wound up with, you know, it, right be- during COVID I sat down and I organized them all. Cause I was like, all right, I've got all these poems. What am I going to do with them? And I, I did, I put together a poetry book and I had 40 of them that I had created over a period of, you know, two or three. And it wasn't like I was writing every single day. Right. Come to me and I may not get another poem for maybe two or three weeks. And then I would get it and I would have to sit and some of them would come right away. I would sit down and write it and then others would, would take longer. But you know, that, that's just a piece of self-care and a piece of you know, growing and healing, you know? And then, you know, when I went back and looked at them, I was like, wow, a lot of these are about struggle. Mm. And, and you know, I don't know, was I struggling? At, I, I didn't feel like I was in a struggle, but maybe it was, it's something meant to help me later on. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, but, you know, tell us a little bit about some of the poems that, that you've written. Are they, um, are they more for children? Or are they more for adults? I've done both. I've done, I have done both, especially when um, Carson was little. I had all this children's poetry come out, you know, all for little kids, uh, different ages. And it just kind of was just, like you said, sometimes it just kind of comes out. Mm-hmm. What I know about poetry, at least for myself, if I go into nature, nature is a igniter for me for metaphors in life. And so if I'm blocked or stuck or need grounding or need to be peaceful again and kind of like re uh, reassess myself or restart myself or recalibrate being in nature for me is just like, I don't know, it's medicine and it is nature's medicine. Right. And so I, when I write, I try not to get in my way. I try to allow to be this like, um, you know, a conduit where this information is coming through. So you're doing this automatic writing because for me, it feels more pure than if I'm, um, thinking really hard, trying to find something that's going to work, you know, words that are going to match or uh, words that are going to make sense. I almost like, I try to allow it to flow because then to me, it feels more like it's coming from a purer place. And so I do have those, Sally, that'll just come right out. And then I'll have ones that'll like maybe five or 10 lines will come out and then it stops. And then I can't, it just, nothing else is coming. And so I'll put it to the side and then I'll come back to it. And so, yeah, that's the same thing that happens to me. I have no idea how many poems I have because I have them. I have some written down and I have those <laughs> typed in my computer. And so I, I need the paper in the car. I oh mean, yeah. I have a stack. I had a stack in like with you know on um, those clips yeah in, in the drawer over here I had some okay. of them on the computer I mean they were all over the place and I was like all right let me see if I can well during COVID I was like looking for stuff to do and I was like all right let me yeah. see if I can piece all these together and find and maybe oh, right. I can put something together so um, well and then I've got them on my phone too you know you have yeah. your note section so I have mm-hmm. I have them in there that I have actually taken off finally and put them on my computer but um when, after Carson was born and after all of that happened, when I go back and read those, that was about finding myself. That was like, those were poems like, oh, there you are. I've been looking for you for so long. It was like, I was so lost. And so it was, we, we had just gone through a very, um, well, uh, there was a situation that happened with my middle daughter and it was a court case that happened to finally come to 
I had to go to court when I was in the end of my pregnancy with my son and I was really on bed rest. And, you know, we were on a day-to-day watch, whether he was going to be okay, have to rush and get him out. And I had to go and defend my daughter in court because she had been that we had, there was an abuse situation that had happened at school with her and several other children in her preschool classroom, preschool, kindergarten. And it took all those years. And so it finally came to court right at that time, right? What a horrible time for it to come. So as I was sitting on that stand saying what happened to my daughter, I was praying that I would not lose him or that he wouldn't come out, try to come at that time and take care of me. God, please take care of me and my son. So pretty intense time. And then he was born and the aftermath of all of that, that happened, it, I think I had been doing so much trying to for justice for my child and my family. And in the name of no one should ever do wrong to a child. I don't care who you are. I lost myself somewhere in there because I went on some automatic, yeah, like mama bear took over. I was just this body that the mama bears living in, you know? And so after coming through this fog of, of the end of the pregnancy and then recovery, um, what I wrote during that time was this precious stuff for a child about knowing that you're okay, no matter how you come into this world and mommy loves you anyways, and trying to find myself like, Oh, there you are. You know, the, the fog has cleared and, and there you are. You know, I, I, I wrote something about, we went to the beach when he was five months old and I stood on the sand in the water by myself. And it was like this electricity went through my body. And, and I remember that night I went in and rode and it was like, I rise upon the sand again and stand 10 feet tall. And that's how I felt. I was alive again. I was like, I'm going to be okay. You know, right. I'm going to, I'm going to be all right. He's okay. I'm okay. We're here. And, you know, it doesn't matter what else is going on, but we're going to be okay. And I think that, I mean, for me, writing has always been a very, very powerful tool for me. And, and I get asked the question, what do you do when you're not writing? Well, when I'm not writing for work or a book or I write for myself, you know, I try to get up early in the morning and write because whatever's going on in here and here, I put it on paper or I put it in my, my tablet and then I can go on with my day because I put it here. It's like you take that bag of garbage off. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you're something thinking. about releasing it, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you yes. sit there and you write it down, it, it, it like puts it out there. And then, you know, it, it's kind of just like a release, like a letting go. It, it's a purification. It's like, yeah. it, it, they call it, you know, vomiting on paper, whatever you're emotionally vomiting. But the thing is you can say, you know, I always say paper doesn't judge. It doesn't, there's no judgment there. Write what you need to write yell, scream, I don't know, rip the paper up, you know, light it on fire (laughs) safely, right? You know, stand on it, stomp on it, break it up. I mean, this is kind of some of the stuff I do with other people trying to help them process through. And it's so therapeutic because you've taken, it's like, you don't have the responsibility of carrying all that inside of you anymore. And you've done it in a very safe space because nobody's telling you that it's wrong or you can't do that, or you can't say that, or you can't think that or feel that way. Nobody's controlling you. Right. So it's a very safe place to do it. And then if you, you know, if you've written something that you don't want someone to see, then yes, you probably want to rip it up. You know, if you're writing, I hate you a hundred times on a paper, you probably want to get rid of that. (laughs) Right. Yeah. But it's, I think people really underestimate the power that they have. That's a choice that you have. That's power that you have in that moment is to choose for it not to have control over you anymore and to choose to let that go. And you're no longer a victim. You're going to be a victor over because that's, it doesn't make it okay. What someone did. I mean, you know, I am, what are we, let's see, it's 2021. So we're 11 years after someone abused my daughter. That's a lot to forgive, a lot to forgive, Mm -hmm. right? And to find a positive out of that, not only for me, my family and my daughter, but, you know, she, to me, she's one of my heroes because she has been able to look at it and go, 
there must have been a purpose for it. And I uh, see, I can't, I can't even get there, you know, <clears throat> because to me, I don't think there's a purpose for anyone ever being harmed, especially a child. But for her to have that clarity speaks volumes of what we can do as humans and the forgiving process of someone else. It doesn't mean it's okay what they did. It just means that it doesn't affect you anymore. We don't let it have power over us. Right, right. Forgiving isn't for the other person. Forgiving is for you. Right. It's it's letting it go and, and not, and not dwelling on it constantly. Right. I mean, that's, that's what forgiving is. Um, So, yeah, yeah. It's great that she was able to, to do that. Yeah. She still has triggers and everything, but you know, we we're talking about self-care and it is so important for us. You know, if you're a strong woman, Sally, you're a strong woman. I'm a strong woman. We're entrepreneurs. We're, we're working to have success in our lives and whatever shape that is, whatever format that falls in, it's different for every one of us, but we have to teach our children, especially our daughters, self-care so that they don't uh, not only just plunge through life, living life and not learning to take care of themselves, take that time out when they need, you know, um, relax, take a day off, don't get on the phone, don't answer phone calls or don't, you know, whatever it is, if you need to binge Netflix all day long, you know, if that's your self-care for the day, we have to teach our daughters. And, uh, you know, that was a, an eye opener for me raising girls, um, because we don't realize what we don't teach our children until something comes up. And it's like, wow, I totally forgot in the busyness of life to teach you how to do this, you know, and how do you, cause I think when we are saying to our children, you got to stand up for yourself, unless you give them examples, they have no idea what that means. Right. 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 Cause we tell our kids to be nice. Right be nice to people. Don't say ugly, mean things. Don't hurt somebody's feeling. Well, what you get from that is a child who's afraid to say almost anything because they're afraid they're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Then we have to reteach them that self-care. One of the many ways of self-care is actually standing up for yourself and saying, you know what, this isn't working for me. Like our roommate situation isn't working. If your kids are in college or a friendship isn't working at school or at a job, you know, this is not working for me. And I'm, you know, I have to look out for myself right. and you don't have to be mean about it, you know? Yeah. And it's setting those, teaching them how to set those boundaries too. Yes. You know, you wouldn't say anything mean, you don't need to take, let other people say mean things to you and accept it either. Right. Um, so teaching them how to use their voices and teaching them how to stand up and, and setting those boundaries at, at a young age. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I know you, you had talked about having that tap on the shoulder, you know, when you, uh, you, you had that book idea and, and, and it was just like, okay, I got to get this out. I got to get this out. I got to get this out. And, and finally just, you know, I, I, you know, that's happened to me numerous times where, you know, you wake up thinking about it and you go to bed thinking about it and it's like, all right, well, you know what, I guess maybe this is something I'm supposed to be doing. If I can't get this out of my head. You um, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Listen to that. Because that's like your, that's your higher spirit, God, whatever you want to call it, your angels, your, your crew, your team, they're talking to you because we're so busy not listening because we either think we know, or we're afraid to hear it, you know, because what if I'm not good? What if I can't be successful at this? That's hard. You know, I mean, I was taking a chance on myself by getting something published by even taking a chance to send out a letter, you know, Hey, you know, your pitch letter and, or your query. And that, that took a lot of, that took a lot of guts to do that, to go, Hey, I'm just going to try this maybe, you know, but as soon as I surrendered and listened, that's when all these doors opened up, you know, and that's another interesting thing in life. If we'll get out of our own way and we'll hush the little chatter in the head and surrender, a lot of times the doors will open up for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And even that self-talk that is negative, if we can just quiet that down so we can hear what is our truth really, 
not what we grew up hearing from our parents or someone in the household or a sibling. What is our truth really for us? You know, and it's not about ego. It's about the brilliance that's inside all of us because we were given that at birth. And then life kind of life dims that flame as we go along yeah. with all the interactions and the, and the experiences we have. And we've got to, we got to figure out how to put that flame back up really right. bright. Right. And the key is finding other people, you know, who, who mm -hmm. are, who are doing the things that you want to do or who are in that, in that space. Yes. Um, you know, it wasn't until I stepped out and started, you know, zooming with <laughs> these, all these wonderful women that things that op other opportunities started opening up to me, That's you know, amazing. when I was, you know, it, I'm like, well, you know, I've been sitting here in my little house in Connecticut praying for opportunities for years, but I wasn't, I wasn't taking any chances. I wasn't stepping mm. out of my comfort zone. I was getting up, I was going to work, I was paying the bills and, and, and that was it, right. you know, and it's not until you listen to that voice in your head and do something that scares you, that's going to turn, you know, turn things around and make things start making things happen for you. Right. You anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I really believe that, it, it, I mean, listen, I've been, you know, it takes us a lifetime sometimes to learn these things, right? You know, I mean, we're not born with all this stuff or what we'd be bored in life if we knew everything from, you know, childhood on, but uh, <clears throat> not listening to our intuition and guidance, not listening to the, whatever our spirit is wanting to do, what it's calling us to, because we're all we all have the ability to be creative. We're, we are creative beings, period. But, um, and, but that can take lots of different shapes and forms. You know, somebody who is an architect is actually creative because they're building buildings, they're designing, right? So when we don't listen to that, I think, and we don't take care of ourselves well, and listen, I am still working at it every day. I'm not good at it. I'm a mom. We're, what do we do? We self-sacrifice all the time, right? So we really have to, we have to stay on our butts about taking care of ourselves, you know, but I, what I have come to understand is that when I don't, then it's self betrayal in a way. And that's some of the worst betrayal that ever happens to any of us is when we betray ourselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I would often say, you know, I would disappoint myself so much easier than I would disappoint anybody else. You know, yeah. I made a promise to myself or I wanted to do something and, and then someone else asked me to do something at the same time when I, you know, I would have no problem disappointing myself and doing things that I didn't want to do just to make someone else happy. Right. Then to, um, you know, step into my power and do something that, you know, do something differently. Yeah. So, and I think as, you know, as, as women and, you know, I don't, I don't know where we get that from it. I, if it's stuff, if it's on the media and the news or just maybe from our, our mothers teaching us to just, you know, okay, you know, you're a girl, you got to take care of everybody else, you know, but um, we learn that selflessness and then we, we, we feel guilty when we do something nice for ourselves yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like, you know, Crazy. I just worked, I worked all week long doing, you know, working, cooking, cleaning, you know, if I want to go get my nails done or go get my hair cut, you know, I think I deserve that, you know, and we, we yeah. get, we feel guilty for either spending money or spending time on ourselves. I know, um, isn't that amazing? Or, you know, going out with the, your, your friends or something, doing a, a girls night when the kids are you know it's like well I should be one staying home with the kids or hiring a babysitter I mean I remember those days it was like you you just feel guilty for for doing stuff and you know I don't know I don't know it it's are, amazing it's amazing I and I, maybe it's generational you know because of, of where our parents came and their parents and the belief systems and you know it, it's funny I had somebody say to me once she said, you know, you're the only person I know who likes their kid to be around their kids. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. Now, I have lots of friends who like to be around their kids, but there's this one person who said this right. one time and I saw it. It just sounded so odd to me because I was like, you don't like 
to be with your kid. Um, I don't, I don't understand that concept. You know, I mean, I take my mothering and my parenting. It's very important to me because, well, one, I always wanted to be a mother and then I was told I would never be a mother. And then I have become a mother. And so I had, you know, four pregnancies, three children, and I consider them all miracles because I was told I couldn't. So with that, it, to me, it makes it even that much more important, you know, and, and such a blessing and a gift to be able to do. Now, it doesn't mean that a gift is not challenging because we know parenting is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. So why don't you, what do you have coming up next? I know you have, you have something coming up soon, right? Another book? Yes. I'm so excited, Sally. Oh my gosh. I'm just, oh my gosh. I'm so excited. So this was written in 2018 and it's been kind of like, we've been getting there and getting there and getting there. So October 19th, um, we are launching. And I say we, cause it's my co-writer and my friend Thornton Klein and I, it's called cheers from heaven. And it's a middle grade reader. So I have we have gone up to a higher age and, uh, my daughter, my 17 year old daughter, or she's 18 now, excuse me. Um, she did the cover, the front and the back, and she did the illustrations inside. So, oh my gosh, I'm so excited about that. Wow. So we kind of have a little, you know, family thing. So it's really fun because my children's series, the three books that are in the series for littles has my son. That's his, his face on the cover. It's a character kind of picture, you know, but, um, tears from heaven is, it's really important to me because this month is national uh, bully, you know, awareness month. Um, and it's our national bully prevention month. I, they said they're both sound the same, you know, they mean the same thing, but right. so this is a story about five friends who had bullied a child who, who did pass away. So we come into the story about six months in after this happened and they um, end up one by one feeling guilty for what they did and they want to find forgiveness. And so they go and they visit his parents asking for forgiveness and they end up on this, you know, really incredible journey and this um, learning a lot about themselves and growing in ways they never imagined and learning to forgive themselves. And then they turn around and teach their friends how to be better friends. So it's, it's such an important story I feel for right now, because we've got to teach kids how to be, um, to come from a place of empowerment, to have tools, to be able to process how they're feeling and what they're going through and to be able to get to that place of balance again, or, um, uh, like a green zone, if you want to call it, mm-hmm. you know, a better place of emotional stability so that they can be better to each other. They can inspire each other. They can be motivating because that's so much more powerful than tearing somebody down. Right. And so, you know, I just feel like this story really needs to be out there in the world. And I just, I hope people will buy it. You know, Tuesday, we're starting the ebook sale for two 99. And then the following Tuesday, the book will launch. And I'm just, I, I'm just so excited about it. You know, we're hoping it's going to turn into a film um, for kids and it's got, you know, it's not, there's so much out there right now for kids that has up the level of what thrills a child, you know? Um, but we've gone back to sort of a more peaceful place in this book and it's, it's, it's a much gentler story and it's, it's about being kind to each other. It's about being nice. It's about, you know, really just being a good person in life. Um, and, and hoping help kids to not be so self-absorbed, you know, to think about what their actions to others, how it, ha- what it does to those people, you know, or their friends. So in the back of the book, there are applications for students and then, you know, classrooms and, and schools to uh, apply. So. Wow. That's great. That's, that's really exciting. I'm, I'm really happy for that. I, you know, I don't know if you in my, in the book, the um, invisible, no more invincible forevermore. I write about being bullied as one of my, my stories yeah. about when I was bullied as a teen. And so one of the things that I, you know, I always, you know, in the back of my mind thought about writing was um, overcoming as, from the victim's standpoint, yes, different tools and things you can use to overcome 
when people say mean things to you. When somebody has um, bullied you. I yeah, think that you should. I think it's you. a really, I think it's a really good thing. I saw something, I'm trying to think of where I saw it, somewhere online. And I, it, it was about, you know, 100 things to do when someone's been mean to you. And I thought that was really great. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. I thought we need more of that because um, <clears throat> our kids, sometimes they're not learning it at home. Sometimes they're learning worse ways to be and worse behaviors online, social media, um, or from friends or from siblings or from family members. And, you know, I, I think there'd be a lot less depressed children in this world. If, if they were taught these tools, if they were taught tools to process how they're feeling so they would understand because, you know, their emotions are so big. Right. And they can go right. from laughing to crying in one second, two seconds. You know, I, I have a daughter like that. She'd be like, I'm fine. And the next minute she's crying. Oh my gosh. Okay. What's happening here? You know? <laughs> and so, and for girls, we, you know, a lot of girls tend to do that, but when they're, you know, going through those times in their life, but I just think that if we can start our kids out with positive language in the children's series, I have, I have an, I am page in each of those books. And it's to get children and families started on that positive, motivating language of affirmations of I am, I am joy, I am love, I am happiness, I am fun, you know, you are, you are amazing, you are awesome. And, and having those go-to words that a child can always have with them if they're feeling down and having a hard, difficult time. And to even talk themselves maybe down from anger or frustration or sadness or whatever it is that they're feeling. Um, but helping them to have tools to get from A to B, you know, mm -hmm. A, if mm -hmm. you're, if you are just having incredible anxiety, cause a lot of kids have that right now, adults, we do too, right. you know, right. but if you can teach them to, okay, jog in place, do some jumping jacks, do some yoga, walk outside, get on a bicycle. What it does is it negates that anxiety. It kind of, it's like, um, if you, <laughs> you know, when you're talking to somebody and they switch what they're saying, it's like squirrel, you know, that, you know, getting their attention on something else, yeah. those things will help put you back in your body and help you ground and to be able to be calmer so that you can then look at a situation or an emotion logically, you know, as logically as you're able to, to process through, okay, is this really how I feel? Is this the truth for me? What am I going to allow to bother me? What do I need to do here? Um, you know, even the self-care. Okay. What does my body need right now? Like my, my knee hurts or my back or headache. What does my body need right now for me? You know, so we need to listen to that. You know, is that, did you have an upset earlier in the day? And now, you know, you've got some anger sitting somewhere in your body. Cause we tend to carry those emotions with us, don't we? Yeah. So there's all kinds of tools out there and it's not really rocket science. I mean, but it's, it, but being able to share those tools and give examples of them to others, that's what we have to, you know, we have right. to put it and in a motion. Lot of kids, kids have no, and it's not just in school where they're getting bullied, you know, a lot right. of, you know, you're getting bullied at home and even as adults, you know, learning how right. to, you know, we're getting, you know, talk to at work or, or, you know, in, in, in family relationships and things, you know, there are, uh, there are a lot of situations where we could use those tools to change our mindset or to, you know, to, you know, so we're not depressed. We're not, right. you know, thinking about, you know, what's going, you know, what's going to happen next. So, Oh. And it's hard right now. I mean, you know, my girls, like my, my one college, one high school, I, I am not any different than any other parent out there with a kid in school through this pandemic, who is some days freaking out because what's going to happen tomorrow and what's going to happen with my school. And can I see my friends and is somebody going to get COVID and die in the family? I mean, this, right. still, this is right. relevant to all over the world. And so one, I think for me last year, the biggest stress was watching my children and their mental, emotional health. And so I just said, okay, listen, this is what we're doing. What can we focus on right now that's positive 
what do we have control over right now in this moment? And one of those things is the choice of choosing what we're going to focus on, right? And let's be productive somehow. Let's find some way to be creative. Let's find something to do. You know, I always made sure my girls had an outlet. I, I think all children need, an, need outlets, physical outlets, and they need creative outlets in order to balance the brain, you know, along with their academics. It just makes that whole triangle, you know, full for a child. And my oldest has a hard time saying how she feels. So I would say, okay, write it out for me. So her writing would always tell me what I needed to know was going on with her. And she still does it. She, and she's at school and that's her, one of her majors. And she is an incredible writer, but she was given that outlet. So it didn't fester. It didn't explode. And it didn't take her down to the depths where she can't come back out. She's been able to use that as a tool that playing an instrument, singing, dancing, running, whatever it is, you know, there needs to be a physical action to release that, that emotion you're feeling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. So let me see what, um, what, what, how can people connect with you if they want to learn more about what you are, what you're doing or the connect on you with, with the books that you've got coming out? Yeah. So just go to maryejackson.com. So www.maryejackson.com. You, all my books are there. And I've got stuff for advocacy there as well. There's links to the shows and I will continue adding information, PDFs, videos, things like that there, you know, for folks. Um, And um, then also, you know, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and and Instagram, I'm those places, but the easiest place to find me, you know, is on my website. Um, Was there anything else you wanted to share with the audience? Well, I just, I just hope that there's value in the conversation we've had because, you know, sometimes even the smallest step that we take toward processing something we're feeling or where we're stuck or hurting can be the biggest thing that we do for ourselves in that moment, you know? So take something, a tool of some sort and put, put those steps forward to help you because, you know, when we don't do that for ourselves, we only hurt ourselves more, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. And remember, you know what, no matter how you came into this world, you were okay. You're all okay. Yeah. We're all okay. (laughs) It's a little crazy right now in the world, but we're okay. Right. (laughs) crazy (laughs) yes weird is good it is good it can be fun too right yeah you gotta have some fun you gotta have some fun absolutely lanny is here lanny did you have any questions for mary before we head out well i got uh knocked off for a couple minutes okay so you may have answered this you use your poetry in your books in your children's books Actually, they're written in rhyme. So to me, that's poetry also. And rhyming, um, you know, for children, it's, they learn so much easier that way. It's easier for them to remember. So the poetry that I've been writing on my whole life is separate from the books, except for that I wrote them in rhyme. Um, And at some point I will publish some of this poetry. I just don't know what, maybe Sally and I will put a book together. Who knows, (laughs) right? Does your your poetry rhyme? Mm -hmm. Yes, most of my poetry rhymes. Mine, mine has to. It's something in my head. My, mine has to rhyme. It's chronic. I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, it was a great program. I enjoyed every every minute of it. Every minute oh. I could watch. Well, thank, thank you, Lady. We appreciate that so much. Yeah. And um, and if you write something, let us know. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mary, for joining us today. And thank you everyone for being here. And we will see you next time on the Self-Care Rockstar Show. Thank you. Thanks.